welcome everybody. This is um, something I'm super passionate about. We talk a lot about transformation. We talk about a lot about the strategy, all the things we're trying to do. And people do talk about culture, but they talk about it more as how do we get what we want from the culture? How do we move through? How do we get the culture to be the way we want it to be? And I'd like to argue here that your people are actually the asset that you have in your organization. And you should be looking at the culture, absolutely moving on and through with the culture, but taking utter respect and really thinking about the people you have and how to enable them to make the most difference they can make for your organization. It's all about them. The uh, underlying all of this has to be respect, respect for everybody in the organization, no matter what their role, no matter how senior or junior that role is, every single person deserves respect. And when you don't treat people as if you respect them, you can't expect but to have a really difficult time. But this respect goes even further. If you're trying to make a transformation, then you have to respect what they did before this transformation. You need to respect the fact that this company potentially has been running for quite a long time. It's delivered stuff before. It's done a good job. Um, and even if you believe that maybe Agile is a much better way of working than the waterfall way they've been working, if you don't go in there with utter respect for the things that they've done before, you will hit more resistance. You will hit more problems. Your transformation, you might be aiming for the best thing in the world, but if they don't buy into that, you will not achieve it. Okay, so I'm going to talk a little bit uh, about Handy's sort of description of organizational cultures because it's quite a simple model and I think it's really quite useful. When you're looking at actually doing a transformation, it really is useful to think a bit about the current culture and where you want to move to and understanding those. So he has four areas that he talks about as, as organizational cultures. The first one of those is a power culture. So in a power culture, it's like you have a spider in the center of the web. So there's one person who knows everything that's happening. They can feel the sort of the, the vibrations in any of the, the things that are coming through. They understand the strategy. They understand why it's got to be that way. They interpret the information that comes in and sends out more instructions. This tends to come in an organization that was a startup and has now grown much bigger, where there's a particular person who set this company up and is really central to it. But what tends to happen in these organizations is that anybody on one uh, part of that web doesn't know the detail of the other parts of that web. They only know the details of the bit they're on, and they don't necessarily understand the, cultural, the, the strategic significance of the bit that they're on. So people who really could make a difference, who really, really want to, um, will tend to leave an organization like this after a period of time because they cannot make the difference that they want to make. And what that tends to do is convince the person in the center they're doing absolutely the right thing because they can't rely on anybody being there long term. So it tends to be self-fulfilling. Uh, the second type of culture is a task-oriented culture. So this is where um, groups of people get together to solve a particular problem that exists in the organization. And uh, they maybe get together, maybe it's a project, maybe it isn't. There's a particular issue, they get together, they solve that problem together. Now these might be long-lasting groups of people, teams, or they might be people who are gathered together, run a project and break up and do. But there are organizations that work in that way. And probably, to some extent, this is the direction um, that a lot of organizations would like to take at the moment. We then have the person-oriented uh, culture. So in here, it's who you are that matters. It's what skills you have that matter. It's what cross skills you have that matter. So this is about which individual is the right person to do this thing. 
Um, these are really, really rare, and they tend to be quite small organisations. Um, but they do tend to be very popular with people who are those change agents who really want to do things, because people can and are allowed to make the difference they can most make. And then we have this one, which um, I think probably most of us will recognise, which is the role-based organisation. And that is your job title says what you do. Your job title defines what you will be involved in and uh, the extent of your power and um, that way of working. So I'm going to talk a little bit today about an organisation that was absolutely in a role model culture and the transformation that I worked with them on moving far more towards the task-oriented culture. So uh, this was a financial organisation and I was head of software delivery. So I was in that hierarchy and I had particular things that I was allowed to do and not do. It was 140 years old, financial organisation, very hierarchical. So to try and move them from a completely waterfall way of working to an agile way of working and looking at digital transformation along the way and things that we could do to improve customers' experience um, and to actually improve the way that we worked internally to digitize that um, was a really interesting thing to do. So this organization, as I say, 140 years old, um, it also had what I think a number of uh, organizations do, those people who sit between the people who are trying to do the coding, to do the solutions, to do the testing, to get it to where it needs to be, and the people who actually want that. Now, yes, the actual end person who we hope wants it is the end customer. But a lot of these organizations, there's an internal customer. So when I joined this one, uh, the uh, software delivery was across the whole organization. So all of this tools and services that the organization used as a whole. But the BAs, when I joined, uh, told me very proudly that they were the gateway into IT. And they were. The people who were providing these solutions were not allowed to speak to any of the people who wanted these solutions. The business analysts did that talking, and the business analysts decided what was important, what wasn't important to get done, not the people in the business. And um, I, there was one lady who uh, was head of mortgage services, and I remember her sort of uh, telling a tale of there was a particular change she requested before she went on maternity leave, and her son was now 10 years old and she didn't have it yet. And um, luckily, that particular one was with an external vendor, not with my team. But nonetheless, there were many things of that ilk. We uh, did a piece of work to actually analyze. We used JIRA to, to collect the requests that came in from the business. And we, hold, we held a little uh, competition to see who could guess the total age of all of the tickets in JIRA that were still open and waiting for our attention. Um, and it turned out it was 574 years, uh, which was lovely. But interestingly, after actually doing that calculation, and we kind of made it a bit of fun to see who would get closest, after we did that, within a week, our oldest ticket, which was 12 years, had shut. And um, quite a lot of the older tickets, because people had started to look at them again and ask people, is this really what you still need? Let's actually just make sure we clear the decks and we end up with things that you really want to hear about. So really important for me in this was engaging the business. Um, typically in a transformation, people see it as a technology transformation and not a business transformation. And I think that's what they achieve. They achieve a technology transformation. But the business continues to work in the way it did and tries to use those tools to just carry on in that way. But also, a lot of these techniques we're talking about using are really useful in the business as well. After all, um, lean techniques, Kanban, didn't start in software. It started in manufacturing. 
this is, these aren't tools that are designed for software. We've adapted them to use them within software. And they're very useful for other areas. We engage the business in a number of ways. Um, I stood up at an internal operations conference and explained to people roughly what Agile was and what it was trying to achieve, because most of those people had never, ever heard of it. Um, and I invited people at that conference to come and do some experiments with us and to try out working in this way. And I had quite a lot of people interested in that. I'd like to say it's because they're super interested in this transformation, but I think it was just they hadn't had any changes done for so long that they were desperate to try anything. And we chose one of the business areas and we worked with them. Um, and we worked in a small team. It was only a couple of developers. Um, we met every day with them. We, it was a fixed period of time, a trial to get certain things done in an area. And uh, little did I know at the time that the person we had chosen to work with hated IT with a vengeance and was the person who would tell everybody how bad it was, how nothing ever got changed, how awful it was, it slowed the business down. Um, I didn't know when I chose them, but I'm really glad I chose them. Uh, at the next uh, internal operations conference, which was six months later, I stood up and reminded people what Agile was, and he stood up and talked about how amazing his experience was, and how he got so much more out of that than he actually had asked for at the start. I remember having a conversation with him at the start where he said, these are all the things we need. And I said, that's fine, but we've got a fixed time. This is how we're doing this. You've got two months. And at the end of that, we're stopping. This is what the trial is doing, we, and we will do as much as we can do in that time, but that's, that's what we're doing. And he said, that's fine, but I need everything on this list. I said, that's fine, but you've only got two months. Um, and we went into it, and he, not only, he didn't get everything on his list, but only because he decided he didn't want some of the things that were on that list once he started to work in and through. And he got things that were not on his list and that he never even would have asked for if it wasn't for the fact that somebody on the team went, don't you want something like this? And he said, yeah, but the BA told me that would take ages, so I'm not, and they're like, well, I did it this morning in five minutes, so do you want to have a look and see if you want that? Um, and those direct communications, that working together to solve the problem, and I think that's what we're really trying to achieve with these things. Other things in engaging the business, so I stepped out of my role which caused problems and worry, not only in the business, but actually within technology as well. Um, so I ran some, a 30-day challenge, 90-day challenge on different problems within the business, nothing to do with software at all, using lean techniques, and actually for the first time empowering the people who do, the, do these things day to day to solve those problems themselves, instead of having their ideas lost in the management chain. And uh, huge things achieved through that, because this is the first empowerment these people had ever had. So really, really um, huge achievements. Um, I knew I was succeeding when I walked around. You know, when I joined the organization, all the walls were pristine. And when I left, I'm really proud to say it was covered in like blue tack holes. I wasn't very popular with uh, with the property services team, but it was covered in blue tech holes and, and scrappy bits of paper stuck up everywhere and Kanban boards sort of just stuck up on the wall and throughout the business, not just within IT. And people stealing some of these ideas and techniques and using them themselves for their own working that they were doing day to day. Um, and I think it's really important when you're looking to do a transformation that you don't just go in going, ha ha, this is what we're going to do, here's all the things. These things are all better, I promise you they're better, just do them and you'll find out. Um, but actually go in and say, where are your problems? What difficulties do you have today? And I, I apply this into IT as well as into the business. So there was one project that uh, the guys were working on when I got there overnight processing of something, data stuff, pulling together all the management information needed every day. And it was just stuck. They'd been working on it for quite a long time. Nothing was being delivered at the end. Lots and lots of work was going on and nothing was coming out. And they didn't really know why. 
So I just got them to put it up on a Kanban board. Just say, right, what are the tasks you're doing? Let's just put it up. And visually, it was really obvious. There were two areas, huge number of tickets in waiting for test and a huge number of tickets in development. Now, there were only four developers on this project, so there were about 30 tickets in development. Um, so the question was, who's doing these tickets? One developer had 20 tickets. And I'm sure he was spending his whole time running around telling everybody where their ticket was rather than actually working on any of those tickets. So I got him to put back 15 of those tickets. Now I know five tickets is too many for the developer to have, but for him that was a big drop and it was, it was going in the right direction. Um, so we moved lots of things back to to-do instead of uh, in development. And what we also did was look at all of those tickets that were in waiting for test and say, well, why are they waiting for test? At the time, the test team was a completely separate team and uh, they were short of numbers and they were prioritizing other projects. So I asked the unaskable question, can a developer te test this area? And the answer was for most of those, they were really happy. There were one or two which were really complex and went into other systems where they said a tester needs to test those. But actually the rest of these, we're happy for a developer to test them as long as it's not the developer who actually developed it. So suddenly stuff was coming out because the developers stopped developing and started testing. And that all just came out of the fact that they visualized their work. So that's just an example of using a Kanban board to help them achieve what they're trying to achieve. And there were lots of examples like that where they had pain and I was able to sort of pull out of the toolbox a tool that helped them to visualize or help them to smooth out the process or to do something like that. And what happened then was this was, these was a set of tools to help them do their job, not a new way of working that was imposed on them. Now, in reality, a new way of working was imposed on them later, but they pulled it in instead of it being pushed in. Um, I'm not going to say that we didn't have anybody who resisted this change. We did really important to um, spend time. So I spent time with those people who resisted the change to explain what it was, to give them what they needed, and then I left them alone. My view was, if they don't want to come on it, they don't have to. I have work I can just give to them. I have uh, support type work, I have all sorts of work which is just little and bitty and I can give to them and they can do that. But actually, we'll just keep telling them about the excitement and fun we're having over here with this way of working and just keep inviting them over. And eventually they all came and the key thing was never saying to them, ha ha, see you do like it after all, um, because that would have sent them scurrying straight back again. Okay, so uh, in any organization, although you're trying to transform and change, you are also, um, you still have to deliver, you still have to achieve the things that you're doing. So it was really important. It took three and a half years to do this transformation because we did it slowly, we won hearts before we changed and made moves. And also the, um, we continued to deliver during that time. So there was quite a lot of time where we were half agile, half not, until we moved completely into cross-functional teams and moving on and through. Um, but there was quite a lot of time where some projects were still completely waterfall. But by completely waterfall, of course, I mean they're waterfall, but we're having daily stand-ups because they're kind of useful as a tool to talk about stuff. And we're meeting with the teams and we're, we're doing that type of stuff. And also we're doing demos because that's kind of useful. And we're doing retrospectives because that's a really useful thing to do as well. So using, again, a number of those techniques, but within the waterfall world. Um, also, before I went in, I was expecting there to be a lot of very large projects. That's what uh, I imagined would be there. Um, and actually, it wasn't. There were some large projects, but actually, it was this plethora of individual JIRA tickets for little changes on lots and lots and lots of the internal systems that the guys worked on. And this is just an example of where I don't believe you should go in and say, right, everyone will be Scrum, 
Everyone will have two week iterations. Everybody will have a demo that's this long and uh, a retrospective and um, they will take this long and it will happen at this point in time. I also don't think that you should spend lots and lots of time trying to make everybody estimate in the same way and trying to make sure everyone's point is equivalent to someone else's point. It's pointless. The effort that you spend in doing that is just not valuable. Um, if, somebody, if a team's work tends to come in, it can't wait two weeks till, the, if something urgent comes up, it can't wait two weeks, then why are you trying to fit it into a two-week iteration? Maybe it should be a one-week iteration, a one-day iteration. Maybe you shouldn't be iterating at all. Maybe you should be using Kanban. Just choose the things that suit the work and also the individuals on the team. This is about empowerment, true empowerment. They should be choosing the way they work. Trust them to choose the way they work. Believe in people. Deal with people if you have to on an individual basis. Uh, we had a situation there where the, um, they weren't allowed to work from home. And when I asked my boss why they weren't allowed to work from home, it was like, well, and there was a particular person who wanted to work from home for certain reasons. And her answer was, well, you know, what will she be doing? How do we know she's going to do it? Blah, 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 blah. I was only a week into the job at the time. So my question for her was, um, is there a problem here? Is there a reason why you think she won't work when she's at home? And she's like, oh, no. I know she'll do it. Um, and so the answer was, well, shall I take responsibility? Let's do an experiment. I'll take the responsibility. It's my idea. Let's see how it goes. Um, and we just completely turned that round. And she was comfortable because I had taken that on my shoulders. Um, we had one incident the whole time that I was there with somebody. Um, and we had a bit of a chat, and it wasn't that they weren't doing their hours, they just weren't in in core hours, and we needed them to be. We had a bit of a chat, and that was it. Continual improvement. I'm going to get thrown off in a minute, so I'm just going to move on slightly. Um, so a number of happy accidents happened. We had people who... Um, as I said, those Kanban balls that just sort of appeared as if by magic. The business started inviting themselves to sessions where we were teaching people about lean and agile and ways of working. Um, the business started to ask us to go in and help run things for them and help them solve their problems that were nothing to do with IT. And I think it's really, really important to take the most and make the most of all of those happy accidents. So at the end of all of that, was this 140-year-old financial institution a super agile organization? No. Software was agile. Lots of agile and lean techniques were being used in, in the teams and in the business. But the people running the business were not yet ready for that real proper step that would have taken them to a much more agile, transformational way of working, tying their strategy in in an agile way into the work that everybody did. But they are far more agile than they used to be, and they are far more uh, productive, and we have a, the, the um, satisfaction score, the employee satisfaction score, rose to 92% during the transformation and after, which is a huge thing. 